Um, it's a privilege for me to be here with all of you. Um, and let me give you an advice. If you are native English speakers, better that you pay attention to understand me. <laughs> I apologize in advance for my broken English. Uh, but if you speak Spanglish, you could be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have had the privilege to serve God and people, but it didn't come without sorrow, to, to see sorrow or pain in people's life. Um, let me start sharing something with you. In Mexico, we have detention centers where migrants are taken to those places where they don't have the documentation to prove that um, their immigration status is legal. Um, I used to attend one church, and we had a ministry in which we um, visited those uh, detention centers to share the gospel with migrants or to identify if someone was victim of human trafficking. In one of those deten detention centers, um, I met Pancho. I changed the name for the protection of the, the person identity. But Pancho was roughly 30 years old. He was from a South American country, and he was trying to go to the States. Uh, but one Mexican police detained him and took him um, in one of those detention centers. Um, I remember that Pancho used to wear undershirts. It's quite common in Latin America. And I saw that he, ha he had like several scars into his body. It was hard for me to ask to him about those. And when I did it, it was a surprise when he said, um, I don't know what happened to me. The last thing that I remember is someone who offered me help. I was in a restaurant um, drinking while waiting this person. And then I just woke up. I was in a place that I didn't know. I saw the scars into my body. And nobody could help me. I remember that that day, Pancho wasn't feeling OK. So we made a um, referral in order he could receive like um, medical assistance. <sighs> Our hearts broken when the doctor said to us that um, some organs of Pancho's body have been removed. Wow. Could you imagine yourself just waking up, seeing the scars into your body without any clue um, that you have been victim of organ harvesting? We live in a broken world. We live in a place where people is facing a lot of distress. Um, so we have a responsibility to do something, and more as a believer. So um, let's go to James 1, 22 to 27. Um, but before, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity and the huge privilege uh, of being here sharing with my brothers and sisters how you have used me, Lord, how I have served you, Lord, and how I have looked after people in distress, Lord. Mm. I pray that, um, yeah, like, my brothers and sisters um, hear the stories, but they see not only stories, Lord, but they see human beings, Lord, that they could remember that every person is um, important because they have been created in your same image, Lord. Yeah. So we need to take care of them just because of that, because they are um, important for you, Lord. Um, I pray that you move hearts today, Lord, that you remove any word that it's mine and it's not from you, Lord, uh, from my mouth. And Lord, I pray that um, after all the shared today, Lord, uh, my brothers and sisters could feel encouraged to partner with you, Lord, and yeah, to look after people in distress, Lord. I pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the world, but does not do what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. 
If anyone considering himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Um, let me stop for a while here. I think that those verse don't need more explanation, but I would like to highlight some principles that I think James is giving to us through those verses. First, I think it's important to realize that James is um, addressing church-going people. He's not talking to pagans. He's talking to people who constantly hear the word of God. In the verse 22, when he talks about deceive yourself, um, it's a reminder that God knows everything about us, including the intentions of our hearts. Uh, as Galatians 6, 7 states, um, we cannot cheat God. Uh, in the verses 23 and 24, the main point of James' illustration about the man who quickly forgets what he saw in the mirror, I think James is not describing a man with poor memory rather than a man with full priorities. Think about it. When you see yourself in a mirror, you see yourself the way how you are. You see um, the imperfections. And if you see this acne spot, if you care about it, you do something for eliminating it or yeah, changing it, improving it. Um, but if you don't care, you just forget about it. I think that equally, hearers only take a quick, a quick glance in the mirror of the world, and they don't do anything to fix the problems that they see. In the verse 26, James is talking to us about one of the risks that we have as Christians, um, that it's becoming religious. Um, so for a while, I and, and think we need sometimes examine our own hearts and to ask ourselves why we are doing things because sometimes we are just doing things for ticking the box. Um, and we need to take care of it because it is being religious. Um, so James is, is talking to us about it. Um, we need to do things with conviction. It means it's a belief into action. It's something that we strongly believe and it drives our behaviors and our actions. Um, in general, I think James is encouraging us to put the truth into practice in our lives. It's not sufficient to have mere intellectual knowledge of the truth, but to live it. Um, could we have the other slide, please? Yeah. I'm sharing with you um, this image, and it shows a man who is following Jesus' steps. I think that we have a huge example in Jesus. Um, he walked the talk. So we just have examples, and if we just go into the Gospels, we could see how he did it, and we could do the same way. Um, finally, James is giving to us some examples of what it means to be a fruitful Christian in the verse 27, and he's talking about widows and orphans. But I think it is not limited to, he's talking in general to people in distress. Um, next one, please. Thank you. Today I want to share with you how I have looked after people in distress in slavery, one of the second largest organized crime in this world nowadays. And probably when I mention slavery, the first references that come to your mind is the slavery that we know in Exodus or Leviticus book. Or probably you are thinking in the African person who had been moved into another country for, um, yeah, exploit, be, being exploit, exploited. Um, so before to continue, let me ask, um, do you think that slavery still exists in our world? Please raise your hands if it is a yes. A yes, if you think that it exists. Thank you. Well, um, people who didn't raise their hands probably um, 
are asking themselves how I have looked after people in distress in, in a problem that um, doesn't exist anymore. Well, let me answer these questions. Next one, please. A slavery still exists and it's well known as human trafficking. And probably you could hear it as well as modern slavery. Uh, but what it is, I'm sharing with you a definition that is approved for, for everyone in this world and it's the United Nations definition of human trafficking. Human trafficking is the act of recruitment, transport, transfer, harboring, receipt of persons by means of threat of use of force, coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, abuse of power or vulnerability, giving payments or benefits for the purpose of exploitation, including prostitution, um, sexual exploitation, forced labor, slavery, or similar practices, removal of organs, other types of exploitation. My aim is not that you learn this concept, but at least that you have an idea of what it is. If I talk to you about Joseph the Dreamer, um, the story of Genesis 37 from verses from um, 12 to 28, you could see how he is a perfect example of a human trafficking victim. If we analyze this story, we could see some of those, the, the acts, the means, and the purpose. When the brothers turned on Joseph, stripped him of the coat his father made for him, and threw him into a pit, we could see the recruitment. They made a plan to capture him, and they used the force. But also, it's clear to see the abuse of power of Joseph's brothers. They were several. They were older than Joseph. So they not only abused their power, but they took advantage of Joseph's vulnerability. Um, also, when, when the brothers saw him, they received a payment. So they got a benefit for it. And the purpose at the beginning was forced labor, but it turned into domestic servitude. Let's remember that Joseph was serving in Potiphar's household. Those are some guidelines that allow us to see some of the acts and means that human trafficking involves. Next one, please. Thank you. So now there are, there are different ways how slavery happened nowadays. And we could see it as forced begging. In my country, it's common to see kids and indigenous people um, walking in the tube asking for money. And they are carrying a note saying, I'm, I don't speak Spanish, um, I'm from an indigenous community, please give me money. And if you think deeply, you could see if, if they don't speak Spanish, who wrote the note? So you could see that it's someone behind of them because all that you see in, in the two have the same note. So yeah, many of them are victims of forced begging. But also we could find um, human trafficking as, as forced prostitution. And I'm calling forced prostitution intentionally. Probably you have heard it as sex trafficking. But I think that calling this way, um, we are not making visible like the reality about prostitution. Because if you see someone, um, a woman in prostitution, it's easy to think that um, it's her decision. She is there because she wants, because um, she doesn't like to work, she wants an easy life and things like this. So I'm going to talk about it later, but in this moment it's for having you an idea about what it is. We have cases of, of forced labor um, as well. And I remember that I used to work for a logistic company. I was selling logistics and I was visiting some companies. And I, even having the training, I've never saw that um, those women uh, that were working in a factory, um, they were making clothes but they were forced, uh, in forced labor. I just realized this when um, the earthquake in 2017, um, when they, they died in the earthquake. Um, so everything has been revealed. So um, we have those cases close to us and sometimes we don't, we don't see it, those things, but it exists. And domestic servitude, I explained to you like Joseph um, story, so. Organ harvesting, I have already shared a bunch of stories with you, and forced crime. Um, there are some states in Mexico, Mexico is well known for the cartels, 
And in several states of my country, um, you could see that men are enrolled into the cartel and they are forced to sell drugs, to kill others, or just to serve the cartel. If they don't do it, um, their families are killed or they as well are killed. Um, we have also forced marriage and indeed it was something that happened in my family. I'm from an indigenous community, uh, but we um, were living in the city and the rest of my family was in my hometown. And I remember that one day, one of my cousins called my sister and me crying, saying like, my mom wants to force me to, um, to marry with a guy. She was 16 and he was roughly 50 years old. Um, so I remember that my sister and I cried to, with my mom and, and we asked my mom to help. Um, Thank God my mom could do something and she was not forced to marry this, this guy. But we didn't know that it was human trafficking. We knew it until I started to work in this area. We have also child soldiery. We find it mainly in countries that are facing armed conflicts or guerrillas. So kids are forced to do irregular military uh, activities. Otherwise their families are killed or as well, they are killed. And finally, we have child trafficking for illegal adoption. And in one of, of the states of my country, the law for adopting kids is not strict at all. So people from abroad, from Europe mainly, go, go to, to my country uh, for adopting kids. They know that the majority of these kids are kidnapped for giving an adoption to them but they don't care because they are blind just thinking in the selfish desire to have a kid. So yeah, this is child trafficking. I have been witness of all of them except child soldiery. And now let me share with you um, more about forced prostitution. In 2015, I moved to New York. I was working for the United Nations, but I was serving as well um, in human trafficking with some churches. And we had a ministry in which we visited the red light district of prostitution in, in New York. And we visited like brothels and dancing clubs in order to share the gospel with women, give some gifts to them, but also to identify if someone was victim of forced prostitution. Over there, I met Maria. Um, she was from Mexico and she didn't speak English. She was orphaned, she told me that her mom died when she was four, and her dad was in the United States working, but she never met him. She was living with her family, but she was desperate to be loved. So she met a guy in social media. And this guy, after one week of started a relationship with her, um, asked to her to move to his hometown. This, this guy gave money to Maria's family in order she could move to his hometown. Interesting fact, this guy was from Tenancingo, a well-known place in Mexico where you could find, like, kids are raised to become pimps. If you go to the place and you ask to, um, to a kid what they would like to be when they are adults, they said, like, I want to be a pimp. So Maria didn't know that. Um, this guy, it seems like um, he had as well like an American citizenship. So they moved to the States. And when Maria arrived to New York, her passport, um, he, he, he took her passport away from her. And she, she has been forced to prostitute. Later she had a baby and he took the baby away from her. With, and, and she has been again forced to prostitute with the promise to see the kid again, the baby. When I talked with her, um, she said that roughly it was two years since she has, has not seen the kid. When I talk, the, the more that I talked with her, we realized that she didn't know that she was victim of human trafficking. I explained those things to her. I explained that it was a crime. I explained the options that she has. And maybe like a month later, 
she decided to leave. She asked us help. And the church helped her. And the last thing that I knew about her um, is that she is married with a Christian guy of this church. And she is now raising awareness about this problem. As you can see, there are a lot of needs looking after people in distress, as James appointed in the verse 27. But it has been really encouraging to see how churches um, are making a difference and how Christians are coming together um, and starting to respond to those needs. Probably if you have never heard about um, the different forms of slavery, um, it's possible that you are not familiarized and you are a bit skeptical. And you could say like, hey Marlene, this problem, it's a problem that happened in poor countries, not in the UK. Let me tell you that the first month when I arrived here, I went to the front line. I met some women in prostitution. When we were talking with them, we realized that they don't speak English. They talk their, their stories, they, they told us their stories, and they said um, they are coming here to work. They call it work. And they are coming back to their countries to see their kids. And then they are coming back here to, to work again. If you think about it, if they don't speak English, how they manage to all this visa process? If they don't have like money, how they are paying the expenses that involves to come here? You could see that there is someone behind them. It's someone organizing all these things. So probably many of them are victims or of forced prostitution. Let me share with you that um, there are countries that are destination, transit, or source. For example, if one kid is kidnapped in Colombia and they are um, just uh, yeah, traveling around Mexico, but they want to take this um, kid to the States, we could see that Colombia is a source country. Mexico is the transit country, and the destination country is the United States. And the UK are the three of them. It's an origin country, it's a destination country, and it's also a transit country. Um, I challenge all of you to check the statistics about human trafficking in the UK. Uh, you could be surprised um, the huge problem that you have here in the UK. Next one, please. Thank you. Now, there are some red flags that could help us to identify a potential risk of becoming a victim of human trafficking. Um, I'm going to mention some um, um, situations, but it doesn't mean that all of them are cases of human trafficking, but um, it's a potential risk that the person become a victim. And I'm sharing this with you because as, as I told you, it happens in our own families. We could see how the brothers of Joseph saw him, and it happens as well in our families, in our friend, with our friends. Um, so it's closer than we think. Um, so if you know someone who wants to be a model, a model and has been offered a job in other countries with all pay, um, you need to talk with your friend because there is a potential risk of becoming a um, victim of human trafficking. If you know someone who wants to go to another country for working, if it, let me tell you that before to come here, when I knew about London City Mission, my church and I made a huge research about London City Mission mm -hmm. because it was a potential risk. Mm -hmm. Thank God it was a real offer, but there are many offers that are fraud. Mm -hmm. They are not true. So yeah, we need to take care of cases like this because um, we could have potential cases of human trafficking there. If you know someone who met a man on the internet and he's asking her to move from her city, um, someone who is poor and has a large family, someone who is always a company, someone who cannot communicate freely with others, someone who has a barcode tattoo, someone who, does, who doesn't speak the language of the country where they are, someone who has an illegal immigration status, 
someone who is orphaned, someone who has no control over her documents, someone who doesn't know her address, children who appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or someone with a, with a history of emotional, sexual, physical um, abuse. In general, we could see that um, people with a story of abuse, migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, and people facing poverty are the main victims. And as I shared with you, men also are victims, but mainly women and children are um, the common victims because their vulnerable situation set them as a perfect target. And I'm sharing with you this image. Um, we could see the diversity over there. And it's important to realize that the more vulnerabilities that you have, um, the better target you are for um, a perpetrator. And they are so smart. They could identify the vulnerabilities in one person, and immediately they start to work to do something and capture those people. So, um, for example, if someone is a kid, it's women, indigenous, have disabilities, um, it's a asylum seeker, the more vulnerabilities that you have, the perfect targets that you are for the perpetrators. So, yeah. Next one, please. Thank you. Now, what to do? There is no one size fits all recipe for how each one of us should respond. Some of us are called to um, be in the front lines, to engage in hands-on with relational ministries. Others are called to support financially speaking to the people in the front line or with prayers. I'm sharing with you here um, several practical ideas um, in what to do about human trafficking. And the first one is pray for the problem and pray for the people um, that are in the front line. Try to eliminate any misconception that you have about human trafficking. Talk about it in your church, with your friends, with your family, or invite us to talk about it in your church. Start a ministry in your own church, and probably you could, you could tell like, hey Marlene, but I don't know how to do it. I think that um, I, have, I have realized that um, God first needs a willing heart. Probably you could do anything about it, but there are people who you could, could partner with and who you, you could learn a lot. The story that I shared about Maria, I was not attending this church. I was part of other church, and in my church we have a ministry. But I saw the things that, that in this church they are doing, and I wanted to learn more, so I partnered with them. So you could do the same with other churches. And um, yeah, and also as LCM, we are working in ministries like this, so we could, along with you or with your church, and we could help you to, to do something, giving ideas, and yeah, just walk along with you. <coughs> Next one, please. And probably you could tell me, Marlene, I don't think that I have a heart for human trafficking, but my heart is for another people, for another, in, in another area, a different one. Probably you are thinking uh, your heart is for Muslims, your heart is for uh, marginalized people. And let me share with you that I'm part of London City Mission, and there are other ways how you could look after people distressed. Because it's important not only to bring material aid to the people, but also to share the gospel with them. It's how Jesus did it. Check the gospels and you could see how Jesus took care of the material needs, the um, spiritual needs that the people um, had in that time. So we have some areas, council, state and seniors, diaspora communities, Islam and other religions, homeless and marginalized. I'm part of homeless and marginalized. I'm a missionary in this area. And we have also children, youth, and schools. Um, if you want to talk more about this and your heart, you think that your heart um, fits with one of these areas, I invite you to talk on Thursday. And my brother Emmanuel and Joseph are going to be here. So you could talk with them. And yeah, we could give you like practical ideas or just walk along with you and with your church in, in areas like this. So I'm sharing with you um, the email of my line manager, it's Annie Odin, um, and my email. So if you have questions, just write to us and yeah, we could um, 
have a, a better conversation about this. And yeah, also we, well, I brought some brochures, magazines uh, in the back on the table. So you could just take some of the, these, know more about London City Missions. And yeah, it's all that for the moment I could share about human trafficking. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all this, these stories, Lord. Um, I pray, Lord, that uh, my brothers and sisters today, Lord, um, that they don't feel a weight to carry, Lord, that on the contrary, these stories bring um, hope to them, Lord, uh, that they could see how church is making a difference, Lord, and how as a Christians we could do something, Lord. We could, um, we, we just need to walk the talk, Lord, and we need to follow the example of your son, Jesus, Lord. I pray that you help us to, um, that through those stories they could be encouraged, Lord, and they could remember that um, your son Jesus is our hope, Lord. And also as a believers, Lord, we, um, as, as part of your body, we have the responsibility, Lord, to bring uh, a taste of heaven through those lives, Lord. I pray that you raise more workers into the harvest, Lord, because um, there is a huge need, Lord. So I pray that you be with them, that you encourage them, that you ignite their hearts and, yeah, that they desire each day more to serve you, Lord, and to take care um, in people distress, Lord. And it's as Matthew 25, Lord, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, Lord, explained to us um, the responsibility that we have uh, as your followers, Lord, that they could just desire to follow your steps, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity and the huge privilege to be here with them, sharing um, how you have used me. And Lord, I pray that um, you be with them and encourage them. Mm -hmm. I pray those things in the almighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.